Okay. Um, yes. So good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure to be here. I've attended several talks in this very room. And so it really is an absolute honor to be presenting in front of you tonight, um, especially for an organization as wonderful as the Namibia Scientific Society. Um, so yes, as I was introduced, I, my history in Namibia began over 20 years ago as a young biologist. I originally came over to work on cheetahs and leopards and to test some of the methodology that I was currently using on jaguars and mountain lions in the United States and see how um, they would work over here. Um, long story short, they work beautifully for leopards. They don't work at all for cheetahs. Um, but um, that was kind of my first introduction. And it was during this time in 2002 that I met this caracal. It was captured by a farmer. And I was able to take the lead on its recovery and ultimately its relocation and release back into the wild. And I was absolutely mesmerized by this cat. Any of you that have had an opportunity to see a caracal um, in the wild, um, they truly are an absolutely magnificent animal um, that has inspired a lot of artwork and um, is possibly um, the inspiration for um, you know, the Sphinx and several um, really infamous artwork um, throughout the world. So I was mesmerized by this little cat, and I tried to learn absolutely everything I could about them. I learned that caracals belong to an ancient lineage, um, the caracal lineage, which is one of the oldest lineages within the family Felidae. Um, it diverged almost nine million years ago. Um, and they have one of the largest geographic distributions of any cat species as well. They have a very long association with people. Um, they were commonly used um, by Indian nobility for sport. And they were kept by several tribes uh, to hunt peafowl, hares um, for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, where people took advantage of their speed and incredible ability to pluck birds out of the air um, you know, over three meters off the ground. However, despite this extensive history with people, this enormous geographic range, virtually nothing else was known about caracals. We don't know even basic natural history information. Um, throughout that incredible range, there's essentially no population estimates. In many countries, there, it isn't even known if they still exist, um, whether they're declining, increasing. Um, throughout their range, they're listed every, as everything, from everything um, from extirpated, critically endangered, to vermin. And there's never been a large-scale research project on this species. And I also discovered, unfortunately, they have a long history of persecution um, and that they have been extirpated and removed from large chunks of their former geographic range. And for years, I kept hoping someone would unlock the mystery of caracals. And um, eventually I realized that if I wanted that mystery unraveled, that it needed to be me. And that takes us to my current research that I'll be discussing tonight. And I just wanna take a step back in time and kind of set up the foundation for the talk that I'll be presenting on. Um, so conflicts between predators and people occur for a variety of fundamental reasons. Biologically, carnivores require a protein-rich diet and have large home ranges. And this inevitably draws them into recurrent competition with humans who have very similar needs. The domestication of livestock further precipitated this clash because people were now raising ungulates and many carnivores are specialized for ungulate predation. Thus, some individuals may easily shift to domestic livestock when opportunities arise or when wild native ungulates become scarce. We see analogous conflicts around the world where people and predators coexist. And unfortunately, people often retaliate to these losses by persecuting predators. And the root of many predator management policies around the globe stem from predator eradication campaigns. And history, and patterns tend to repeat throughout the world. Now, this persecution is justified because predators predate on livestock and people depend on them. So it's vital to accurately determine the number of livestock actually being killed by predators. 
Now, Namibia offered a great place to examine this exact question. It boasts an incredible assemblage, one of the top of anywhere on the planet, of large predators. And these predators used to be found throughout Namibia, as you know. Um, however, due largely to persecution, they are now extremely restricted with only the pink representing high densities. So carnivore efforts have been largely unsuccessful in the majority of Namibia that is in private ownership, um, predominantly for livestock production. And that's shown here in kind of this brown color. And in these areas where dominant predators have been removed, it makes way for a new apex predator, the caracal. And so I focused this research on the considerable portion of the country that is in private ownership um, used for commercial livestock. So this was my study area. And as we all know, wildlife conservation is particularly challenging um, within working landscapes. So I needed farmer permission and cooperation through every single stage of this work. I went directly to livestock producers. I started with those that were vocal about having conflicts with predators. I made very close lifelong friends. And most importantly, I had these farmer friends vouch for me and this is what opened doors and allowed this research to be conducted. I began simply by asking farmers to allow me to forensically investigate livestock that they suspected of depredation, um, such as this ewe and lamb, and determine how livestock died. So this lamb was stillborn, and we showed this by investigating its lungs. And I found that very few livestock were actually being killed by caracals or other carnivores. Yet, it was firmly known that the farmers were killing a lot of wild predators. So without judgment, I asked if they would simply um, inform me when they killed a predator and um, so that I could necropsy it. And I've necropsied over a thousand individuals. And these um, carcasses provide a wealth of information, um, everything from the source of mortality, diet, demographics, genetics, just to name a few. And I'm actually able to determine past reproductive history by examining placental scars. And so it took a while to gain momentum, but eventually participation grew exponentially. And then something truly transformative started happening. Farmers started notifying me when they captured predators before they killed them. And this allowed us to assess the specific situation um, injuries, losses, and then most importantly, to attach radio colors. However, I didn't attach the radio colors alone. I did this in permission and in collaboration and cooperation with the farmers, and this was key. This helped make sure that they were involved with every step of this research, and this was um, really pivotal because then they were involved with the release of these cats back onto their farms. Um, they were never relocated. And this was substantial because these cats were trapped with the sole purpose of death. So we monitored their movements and forensically investigated clusters of activity where caracals spent three or more hours. Now, we assumed caracals were being killed because they take sheep. So we needed to determine how many sheep they actually eat. And in order to do that, we used three different methods. We examined stomach contents from dead cats, also kill site remains um, from radio collared cats, and scat. And we examined over 1,100 samples to answer this specific question. Um, this was important because each method has distinct bias. So uh, when we combine the three together, we should holistically understand their diet and dietary needs. Since Namibia is such a large country, there's a wide diversity of vegetation types, and each has its own suite of faunal associations. And so we subdivided um, the, our study area into four major categories. Uh, the first is um, what we're generally referring to as kind of this Karoo region. Um, so on the landscape, there's a diversity of succulent plants, um, including some of their study sites had the spectacular quiver tree or cocoa boom. And, um, oops, 
Okay, sorry. So that's just the picture. And so I'm just going to very rapidly display some of the results. And so um, this is the relative percentage of prey items. And this is going to be divided by major category by method um, in each of these four um, study areas. So what I want you to please just take away is just kind of a general idea, general theme, um, not the specific numbers. Um, that's not important. So if we look at the relative percentage of caracal prey items found from stomachs, kill sites, and scat in this region, um, depending on the method, between 33% and just over 50% of caracal diet are hyrax um, in this portion of Namibia. Next, bordering Botswana is um, what we're going to refer to as the Kalahari region. And much of this area is acacia savanna. Now, if we look at caracal prey items from stomach, kill sites, and scat, this demonstrates that in this region, a majority of their diet are small and medium ungulates. And it, we also, it's very interesting to note that um, kill sites, particularly in this region, allowed us to document numerous caracal kills of St. Patrick carnivores. And this is fascinating because we would not have documented this through the other methods because they were very rarely consumed. And if we zoom in, um, that's a, this is a jackal that was killed by a caracal. So in the southeast, in the sparse shrublands, this is the most arid ecotone. And this is caracal prey from stomachs, kill sites, and scat. This demonstrates a diversity of prey items with the highest number of lagomorphs and reptiles, including many species of snakes, several that were venomous. As we travel north, we reach the woodland region. This area had the most rainfall and was dominated by primarily acacia and other woody species. And if we look at their diet again from stomachs, kill sites, and scat, this shows the caracals in this region are generalists, eating primarily birds and rodents, but also consuming everything from raptors, um, from eagles and owls, um, to amphibians and even bullfrogs. And so we found a total of 106 species consumed by a caracal. Um, mammals composed over 83% of their diet. And if we break up the class mammalia into orders, we can see that they have a very general feeding pattern. But most caracals, however, never did take livestock. And um, domestic stock comprised only 2.1% of total caracal diet despite their abundance throughout the study area. However, it's important to note that this was significantly higher in some of those specific regions. So through distance sampling and camera trap data, we examined selection and found that what caracals select for understandably depends on the vegetative region and the relative abundance of each prey species in the system. But the species most highly selected for uh, throughout all the study areas was steenbok, and this was highest in southern Namibia, and um, guinea fowl in northern Namibia. Selection was also strongly influenced by the presence of St. Patrick apex predators, and this is a different aspect of our research that I'm not going to present on today. Livestock was taken and dependent on prey availability, and this has been documented with other species too. And what we found is that um, some caracals, while some caracals do take livestock, the ones that do typically consistently did, and they were often young, inexperienced cats. Um, however, most cats were actively selecting against livestock, despite the fact that livestock was the most abundant ungulate in all four systems. So we're beginning to understand the impact caracals have on farmers' livestock, 
Um, but now we needed to unravel the impacts farmers have on these cats. And so we utilized data from monitored cats and necropsied cats to document survival and mortality. And I'll see if I can get this to play. Um, so we also investigated reproduction from placental scars and from monitoring data. And this is the first radio colored caracal to breed. Um, and her litter size was much smaller than expected um, with just one kitten. Which was, um, that was a very exciting video for me to get. Uh, many, many years of work trying to find, get that video. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Sorry. Um, so according to life table statistics calculated for 208 caracals of known ages um, from Namibian farmlands, um, the probability of caracals um, living to from year one to two is 43%. The probability of them living to five years is zero. And um, however, if we assume, that's assuming a 50-50 sex ratio. Um, if we assume a male skewed sex ratio and 55% uh, male is what we observed in the field via necropsies, this changes. And this makes sense because we know first time in million mothers typically have male offspring. And we also know that mammals that have high persecution pressure typically have male offspring and caracals have both. And um, so if we calculate this with the observed 55% male sex ratio for kittens, it's much lower. And then we can see that the population then is slightly declining overall. Um, so it's just uh, slightly below stable. Uh, if we look at Kaplan-Meier survival curves for radio colored caracals, um, we see how quickly these cats are removed from farmlands, where adults survive longer than yearlings and subadults, um, but they still only have a 20% chance of surviving one year. Females survive longer than males, but still none survived more than two years. And so you can see this is um, highly problematic from a population standpoint. And all radio colored caracals were eventually removed by people. Um, so why are these cats being persecuted, especially at the scale and tenacity that is currently occurring? And so to answer this, I had to get my hands dirty to truly understand farming methods and practices. Um, keep in mind that many of these areas are incredibly arid, and so commercial farmers typically raise small stock, mostly sheep and um, occasionally goats. So to understand the other side of this conflict, I um, was pretty much finished with my dissertation in ecology and decided to make the really tough decision to go back and start essentially a new PhD from scratch in social science, um, which my advisors and committee was not very impressed with, as you can imagine. Um, but I needed to understand the other side of the equation. And um, so I asked farmers to share information with me. I employed qualitative interviews, which is the best, me best method to truly understand conflict. Um, these were semi-structured interviews in a total of um, 561 interviews with 367 farmers. These are recorded, transcribed, and quoted for any social scientists in the room. Um, so if we look at general data from livestock farmers, they reported killing between zero and 81 caracals per farm per year. Um, there were 11 primary methods used for removal. Yet, what was really fascinating is when you peel back the layers like an onion, um, you find that most of them don't want caracals to go extinct. And this offers a true glimmer of hope and um, allows us to try to understand the core of what's truly happening here. Um, there was a tremendous distrust of NGOs in, in many of these farms, and they felt like they weren't um, understanding them. And the greatest threat that farmers recognize they face is drought. And they did recognize that they spend a disproportionate amount of time and money on predator removal in comparison to the impact that predators have on their farms. And um, 
kind of one of the underlying themes that came out of this is that it's fear motivated. This is one of the um, few aspects that they have a lot of control over on their farms. And we see this with species um, all around the world, especially in, you know, some of the um, reaction towards wolves throughout their range. Um, and they told a really interesting story that um, just kept coming up again and again. And um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of this, but if anyone's interested in some of the specifics, I'd be happy to share them. But this theme emerged over and over that the conflict centered around the breed of livestock selected. And almost 90% of the farmers acknowledged that certain livestock breeds were much less susceptible to predation by predators. And so it was necessary to understand sheep. Um, and most conservationists shy away from animal science. Um, you know, sheep is a sheep. Um, but I'm going to give you guys sheep 101. I know there are some farmers in the room, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because I learned that not all sheep are created equal. Um, and this is where growing up on a farm uh, in Arizona was quite handy. Um, so there's the Karakul sheep, and this is brought to Namibia over 110 years ago. And um, it's an arid uh, adapted sheep originally from Central Asia. And they have a fat tail that stores reserves that they can utilize in times of lean uh, resources. They are arid adapted and they're a multi-purpose breed. Um, they're kept for local meat, but they have a smaller frame, a smaller carcass. And so they're less desirable as a meat sheep, as a mutton sheep on the international market. However, adult um, caracul have double coat and this is used for garment production um, to make really incredible um, carpets. But their greatest global value comes from the coat of the neonatal lambs. And this has this unique crinkly pattern that um, often finds its way onto runways um, you know, in uh, Europe and um, you know, primarily in uh, the Western world. Um, so Caracool sheep management, they flock, you use a shepherd, and they're heavily managed and protected. And this stems from the fact that they are flocking sheep, their safety in numbers. They often use a shepherd, they're corralled at night, and you can utilize um, strategies like guard animals. And this is what caracal farming looks like in practice. Um, they can, you can graze them with the strategies of holistic livestock management. However, if we compare um, them to other sheep, and I'm just using the Dorpa as an example, um, but there are several varieties that um, are very similar. Um, they're much more recently introduced, less locally adapted. These are mutton sheep breeds. Um, the tail is typically cropped, so they don't have the reserves, and they are raised for mutton. Um, the, star, the carcass has a much larger, um, is much larger and has a lot more fat marbling, so it's much more desirable on an international ma market. And they are often sold either to um, South Africa or Europe or different places. Um, and these sheep are managed completely differently. This stems from the fact that they require a lot more elbow room. And so uh, stock raisers typically have a much more hands-off approach and you have you know, small clusters of sheep that are out on the landscape, out to pasture, and the lambs are harvested um, at several months old. So on the landscape, you have small pockets kind of all over the place of using their lambs. And they're controlled with fences, often this jackal-proof style that creates problems for many other species of wildlife. So you're probably asking, why do I care about this? You came to hear a talk about caracals. Um, but we need to holistically understand this conflict. And the only way to do that is to go back in time and understand you know, that there was this crash um, in the kind of around 1980 um, in sheep production. And there was this switch then to mutton sheep. And what happened around this time, this was the rise of the animal rights campaign um, and the anti-fur movement. And this was necessary because there were several major personalities that incited this craze for spotted cat coats around the world. And this promoted a mass slaughter 
um, estimated a quarter million leopards, uh, millions of other spotted cats um, to feed the frenzy for this um, leopard skin coat craze. And so like everything, um, you know, their well-intentioned people um, were involved in this movement and it escalated um, from preventing species to be persecuted and go extinct because of their fur and um, implementing strategies of you know, shaming fur wearers and companies. And this spread rapidly throughout the US and Europe. And this was hugely successful in, in decreasing fur demands, uh, which was really important in saving a lot of species. However, um, it, also, it also resulted in decreasing fur demands for many other species, including um, the Karakul sheep. And so um, it wasn't until I merged the ecological data with the social science and then took a step back and looked at this conflict through a geopolitical lens that I truly began to understand what was happening um, here. And so I'll just quickly go through this. Um, and so what happened is the anti-fur movement created this um, pelt market crash, and that led to a switch to mutton sheep. This changed the management strategies because these are breeds now that prefer not to flock. There was a decrease in labor intensity, so there's fewer workers on the landscape. And because there's fewer workers, sick individuals are less likely to receive treatment, which led to an increase in diseases. Um, animals are often in poor health, there's higher livestock death, um, they're more vulnerable, um, and this leads to a greater probability of predators killing livestock. Predators also learn to take livestock from scavenging. There's lots of information um, that shows that. And so as predators continue to kill livestock, there's a decreased tolerance for predators. At the same time, with fewer workers, there is less non-lethal predator mitigation happening on the landscape. And so Sheep are easier to take because they're dispersed all around, not being guarded or watched. Um, with higher unemployment comes higher stock theft. And predators are often blamed when livestock disappear. This is another aspect of the work that I'm not touching on, which leads for lower tolerance for predators. With no shepherds, there are more fences, which leads to higher concentrations of overgrazing. And that can lead to, of course, lower forage quality. Livestock, again, are in poorer condition, um, which feeds back into um, livestock death and lower tolerance for predators. Um, with lower forage availability, you have a decrease in wild ungulates. Um, higher fences mean that there are higher barriers, decreased connectivity, and then with fewer wild ungulates, there's less native prey for predators, which leads to predators occasionally switching to killing livestock, which leads to um, lower tolerance for predators. Um, the time to market now, from going from one day to now three to six months, there's um, a higher number of stock on that landscape. So there's just a higher probability in general that an animal is going to get sick. And um, ewes have higher nutritional demands from increased lactation. And so they're physiologically taxed, which may leads to li lower um, condition, and again, feeds back into this feedback loop. Um, their immune system is also taxed from being in poorer condition, and um, more lambs mean that they need more grass, which again, feeds back into overgrazing. Um, and so all of these things just feed back into farmers operating at the margins. And so they're not willing to take any risks in many cases, and you can't blame them. And so there's a decreased tolerance for predators. And um, this just ultimately feeds back into predator removal. So it's creating a system where one of the primary strategies is just predator removal. And so this has changed the landscape for Namibian predators where the new dominant farming methods came with an approach of completely eradicating predators um, on a massive, massive scale. And the first year alone of this switch um, to mutton farms, um, there was a report and over 3,000 Namibian farmers reported killing caracals. Um, and in my interviews, essentially um, nearly all mutton farmers reported killing caracals within the past year. 
I think that the farmers tell this story best. Um, so this was a DORPA farmer and um, in the interview, this is Farmer 42, the best way to stop the problem of predators is to remove them all. After three or four nights of night shooting and traps during the day, you get most of them. The others get the message and go. If you have good fences, you can keep them away for a few weeks, but then you must start the cycle again. It's a never ending war with predators. Um, so you can see um, how problematic this is for both this farmer and also for the predators on this landscape. Um, so there are true benefits to this caracool sheep farming. Um, the ethics can be debated. This is not talking about the ethics and um, that is something that definitely could be debated. Um, however, there are solid ecological benefits um, to farming with this type of sheep. Um, they have less environmental impact. It can be adaptively managed and you can keep mixed flocks with guard animals. Um, so from just a predator perspective, it's beneficial. Um, and you, know, you can use strategies like this um, to protect lambs so that predators cannot get access to them. And so there are essentially two, depending on the breed of sheep, it leads to two fundamentally different approaches to either managing livestock to prevent losses or removing predators to prevent losses. Um, and predator eradication. And there are dozens of other species and hundreds, probably of thousands of individuals caught in the crossfire of this predator war that are killed while trying to remove predators. Uh, so I've documented um, these species who are killed simply because they make burrows or go underneath fences and they're trying to maintain fences. Um, so particularly porcupines, aardwolves, um, aardvarks are killed um, in um, astounding numbers, um, and I haven't published on that yet. Um, there's lots of other small um, carnivores, St. Patrick carnivores, that are killed with several of the methods, spotlighting, poison, um, traps, um, you know, and um, even small ungulates that are killed with some of these methods. Um, surprisingly, um, kudu calves at night, they blink and look very similar to caracal, and so, um, often uh, you know, many, many farms where they've accidentally shot kudu calves because from a distant spotlighting at night, it looked like a caracal, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. Um, animals that are caught you know, through the fences or the poisons. Um, and then um, in a lot of farms, they've actually killed sheep with some of these methods, um, particularly being caught in things like gin traps. Um, so the lambs that they're um, ironically trying to protect from the predators are getting killed by many of these methods um, themselves. So you can see why this is problematic. And if we look at this map of Namibia, um, the tapestry of black lines represents private farms. So imagine if all of these were fenced and then not only fenced, but laced with fences, jackal proof fences throughout these farms um, for you know, tiny little camps to um, raise sheep. You can see why this is problematic. These are often electrified, and this is a huge issue for uh, many of our incredibly vulnerable species in this country, particularly pangolins and tortoises. Um, so you know, we have to come up with additional strategies. Um, and you know, as everyone knows, Namibia is a very arid country. Um, these farms are simply too dry for most other forms of agriculture. And so there needs to be other strategies and solutions. Um, what I found was that as conservationists, we tend to get tunnel vision. You know, we assume we know what's happening. And, um, you know, without taking a step back, we can really add fuel to the fire. So you can see, you go in there and you see, um, you know, this dead sheep and you assume that you know what's happening. But when you take a step back, then you can realize, okay, well, you know, there's many other issues that are taking place um, in this picture. And we shouldn't just come in and say, okay, well, you have a dead sheep. Um, well, why don't you get a livestock guard dog? We all know now these are sheep that would not benefit from a livestock guardian dog. And so if we come in there with our savior mentality and try to um, you know, offer just these single band-aid solutions, we're going to get shot down and we are not going to establish any type of relationship and truly come with any type of solution. Um, so we have to make sure that the solutions 
are specific to the varieties of sheep and the specifics of that specific farm. Um, and this makes it really challenging because there's no Band-Aid solution. Um, there's no one size fits all. And we need transdisciplinary conservation approaches and we need to really broaden our perspectives. Um, these conflicts are infinitely more complex than we think. I never in a million years would have thought that the you know, you know, runways in Milan somehow were involved with how many predators get killed on a Namibian farm. Um, but you know, that's the case. And so um, to kind of visually model what's happening on the landscape, um, let's just say we have six Namibian farms, um, you know, somewhere between um, eight and 12,000 hectare farms, so very large, nice large farms. Um, they have a variety of game on these farms. And some farmers decide to add sheep. And then other farmers decide just to farm game. Well, on a typical farm that size, we would have one dominant um, resident female caracal. Um, their home ranges are, didn't talk about that, but they're enormous, uh, much larger than I would have expected. I had single cats move over 200 kilometers many times. Um, and um, so there'd be one um, resident female. Um, female caracals are fiercely territorial. And so she's going to um, control her territory. Um, this does depend on prey. Um, and there's going to be overlapping with these females are going to be territorial males. Now from this research, we showed that on average, females are having one kitten per year. So each of these um, males and females, or so each of these females has one single kitten. In this scenario, this landscape is at saturation. These kittens have to disperse when they're old enough. They cannot stay here. There is no room for them. There's no available territories. Um, however, now if this farmer decides that they don't want caracals and remove that male and remove that female, then now we have a completely different scenario. All of these kittens, there's a vacuum. All of these kittens now disperse into that area. And then it starts to become a war and they remove some of these kittens. These are young, inexperienced cats. We know that these are the cats that have the highest probability of killing sheep. And so now if you know, individual cats have you know, overall a 2.1% chance of taking sheep, well now we have you know, so many cats coming, they just keep killing the cats, new cats keep coming, they're killing cats, and it becomes highly problematic. And this is why we can have single farms that remove 81 cats on their farm per year. These are also the farms that have the highest stock losses. And so they're creating, they're feeding back into these scenarios where they're um, creating a system where they're losing sheep and also killing um, enormous quantities of predators. And what's ironic is we can have farms, you know, just adjacent to them that have zero stock losses and don't kill single cats. And so, um, but who gets blamed for this is often the neighbor who's not killing cats. And so there is often this, um, you know, uh, peer pressure for farmers that don't like cats to encourage their neighbors to kill cats too. And then this creates this whole landscape of problems. Um, and often it's, you know, the game farmers. Well, they say all these cats are coming from the game farmers. That's not necessarily true. I had cats dispersing 200 kilometers to find a farm like this where there were all these um, open territories. Um, so, you know, this is going to be, this is not um, something that is going to um, ever resolve itself with this kind of persecution pressure. And um, so, What's important to understand is that livestock breeds can absolutely be selected to decrease um, the um, human wildlife conflict um, and the environmental impact and also the risk of predation. And um, that this is strongly in influenced by the global market. And so every time we you know, go to the store and only choose that giant large steak and don't choose kind of the you know, local steak that was raised right here, you know, we're perpetuating this. And so we need to be cognizant of that. And while no two conflicts are ever alike, every farm was different, um, approaches from this case study can have um, implications 
ethical problems um, with predators in um, similar scenarios. And this issue is not sustainable for either stock producers or predators in the long term. And so there needs to be alternative strategies. And ultimately, shifts in land use strategies are needed that better integrate conservation with agricultural production. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the farmers that took a huge risk on me, got my foot in the door with this community. Um, and, and there were three farmers, uh, farming families, the Manhaza, uh, the Swartz, and the Millers that um, really um, were very key to my success. Um, in this work, and I couldn't have done it without them. And then also the hundreds of livestock farmers that contributed specimens, um, stories, interviews, and most importantly, cups of rooibos tea, um, so that this research could be conducted. And my incredible team of um, assistants, and um, specifically uh, Chris, who is a part of every aspect of this work, um, all the friends that contributed and to my many supporters. So um, with that, I'd like to take some questions and say um, bye, Adanki, and um, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. We're well, homing in on Karakul, but it's almost collapsing now. Um, is there not another type of herding sheep that could be used because farmers are moving to, to meat sheep? Yes, that's, that's, it's an excellent question. And you're, you're right, it is collapsing, um, unfortunately. Um, and you, know, I think any of the true herding sheep that are heavily guarded where you can incorporate the corral method, you can incorporate um, shepherds or livestock guardian, an, um, guardian animals um, could work um, specifically like the um, Damara fat tail is a mutton sheep that has um, a very you know, minimal environmental impact um, as well. So I think there are mutton breeds. I just, you know, highlighted the caracool sheep. Um, and I think it's a really interesting case study um, that I was completely blown away by. Um, but, you know, I think any of those flocking sheep would work in this scenario. And, you know, the, it's just any of them where you are truly managing the sheep to protect them and that is what you're investing your time in as opposed to just eradicating predators. Um, you know, when you have sheep just dispersed throughout the landscape, you know, there's, there's no chance um, of implementing most of these strategies. But that, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. Mother, you are very talented. You are the most talented. You are the most talented mommy I had ever seen. Thank, thank you very much for your interesting talk. There is quite a good sort of analog or whatever you call it. The same with jackal. Remove the jackal. The more you remove, the more they come back. But it's interesting to me is. Did you find any interaction between jackal and the caracal that they sort of eliminate each other and the one try to dominate the other? Obviously, the caracal is bigger. I would suspect they will come second with a caracal. And then just the other, the other question is, how susceptible is the farmers to telling them, leave them alone, allow them to stabilize? Because we have, <laughs> I hear them laughing yeah, at the back. But anyway, and friends of mine also farm in the Northwest. And he told me there's car caracal on his farm and he's left them alone. And he didn't 
as well he's foaming farming with wood goat and he he doesn't lose any of his goats yes um thank you so much and you just proved my point so i appreciate it. i paid him to say that um no uh but but you're you're exactly right there is an interaction between um jackal and caracal and um there were several farms um, that were only removing jackal. And um, you know, so, so you're exactly right. And Caracal do help regulate and control jackal. Um, the problem in some of these farms is that they're persecuting jackal. And as you know, those populations then explode, that then you get such high concentrations of jackal that then the jackal are actually killing the caracal. Um, but in these stable landscapes and these farms um, where they're not, you know, just out there removing predators all the time, um, then caracals will absolutely kill um, jackal. And, um, and I, you know, documented that a lot. Um, they very rarely feed off of them, which is fascinating. So you don't find, you know, if you're just looking at stomach samples or scat, you don't find any evidence of this. But when you go out to the kill sites, you find that they've killed them. They'll often kind of care, cover them up, maybe take a bite or two out of spite, but they really don't feed on them at all. But they are, are killing a lot of jackal. Um, and in fact, I had a few cats that just seemed to just really enjoy killing jackal and were out there just, uh, you know, they would kill, you know, multiple jackals every month, you know, which was really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, I think that um, the farmers are not, very susceptible to, of course, telling them this. Um, what worked the best for me is farmers that did implement these strategies, having them talk to other farmers. So, you know, me coming in and saying, okay, this is what you should do is not going to work. And why should they listen to me? They have no reason to. But, you know, farmers actually saying, um, hey, I tried this. I stopped killing everything. You know, it's taking a gamble. It's taking a risk. But what we're doing isn't working anyway. So why don't we just try something new? Like, why don't we just see if this works? We have nothing to lose. Um, we're putting so much time and money and energy and we're still losing all these sheep. So let's just try something and see if it works. And they try it and it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, it takes you know, probably about six months um, to truly start to stabilize. And then you just don't go out there. And then if you have a loss, you tried to document which individual caused this loss because I found once cats did switch to sheep, they consistently took sheep. So then if you have a loss, you remove that one individual. You are not just out there removing 81 cats a year. You know, that might be removing, you know, one cat every decade. Um, and that's, you know, much more sustainable both for you and also, you know, or for the farmers and also for the cats. They have a lot more fun, more free time then. Um, so <laughs> they're not out there every night spotlighting. But excellent questions. Yeah. Alitris, in your abstract, you indicated that about 2% is predation of stock. Is that correct? Yes, so um, about 2% of the cats um, had ever, ever predated on livestock in their lifetime. Um, that was highest in kind of those arid regions, um, particularly in southwestern Namibia. Um, but, um, you know, in those regions, um, it was about 8% of cats um, in, in certain regions. But those were also, that's not just 8% of the population. Those were younger, inexperienced cats. And so, you know, it's the cats that have time to grow up with a mom, learn how to properly kill steenbok or springbok or dossies or whatever that happens to be within the region that they're at. They learn that particular prey and they tend to stick to that particular prey. It's the cats that are injured that switch. And I didn't talk about that in this talk, but a huge portion of the cats that I caught were injured from other methods. They had escaped a gin trap, they're missing toes. Many of the cats had, when I you know, performed examinations on them, on them, had old bullets in their bodies that had healed over. Um, you know, it was a, a majority of the cats actually had signs of a previous encounter with a farmer that they had survived from. 
um, which I was really, you know, I found just absolutely incredible. Um, and so those cats that were previously captured and had escaped and now are injured, um, often they'll break off teeth trying to get out of a gin trap. Those were also disproportionately likely to become livestock killers. So the two categories, if you're like to look at the entire caracal population, the animals that are most likely to take sheep are injured animals or young animals, specifically young males. And by creating that scenario where you are just going out there and you know killing every predator, you are incredibly um, switching the population dynamics so that you only have those two categories of cats on your farm. And so you are creating a scenario where you'll never win. Um, and you know, you're only going to have higher and higher and higher losses. And you know, but that takes a completely you know, transformative way of thinking about you know, your interactions with predators. And, and that's really hard. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but it, you know, it's really sad because you know, I see these people, I see these farmers struggling and they have high losses and it's clearly influencing their livelihood. And, you know, and they're desperate and yet they're feeding back into a scenario where I know they're gonna lose. I mean, they can't win. Um, but they're, you know, that's what they're decided they're going to continue to do and focus on, um, you know, and I'm not ever going to be able to influence them, but I do hope at some point someone does influence them so that they're, you know, more sustainable in just their own lives and their own livelihoods, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I believe that you mentioned early in the presentation that um, the original apex predators of the ecosystems were removed. Um, could there be a relationship in removing those apex predators and increasing the caracal population, increasing the likelihood of depredation, or does the territory ranges eliminate that? That is a, a wonderful question, and I'm just beginning to examine that, but you are exactly right, and, um, you know, to kind of give away some of the work that we're working on, um, it does seem like there are these trophic interactions with predators. Um, caracal are very strongly influenced by leopard and cheetah, um, and um, so, you know, predators that influence leopard and cheetah, like lions, are probably extremely beneficial for caracal. Um, caracal also, are um, massive bullies to African wildcats, and they really control African wildcat populations, which is probably extremely beneficial to the black-footed cat, um, which is influenced by um, the African wildcat. So there are these trophic interactions that we're just now beginning to unravel, um, you know, looking at these stages, um, and absolutely uh, that's going to be influenced by um, the presence of other sympatric apex predators. Um, what's truly fascinating, I didn't talk about this today, but the diet of caracal is very, very different in areas where they are the apex predator and they're not the apex predator. Um, in areas where they are the apex predator, they're taking much larger prey. Um, they're often um, killing much more sympatric predators like jackal and African wildcats. Um, where they're not the apex predator, they spend probably more of their time, um, you know, in fear. So the, all of the research on the landscape of fear um, and, you know, that ecology, um, ecological influences on them. They're not spending as, as much time hunting large game, large prey, um, or going after sympatric predators. So, um, you know, there's 100% these, you know, interactions um, that, you know, all of it's influencing it. And in fact, in areas with that, they're mostly eating much, much smaller prey than things like, you know, rodents, amphibians, birds. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. And I have just began to tease out all of the dietary work, you know, in areas with and without apex predators. Um, and um, it's, it's really fascinating, but it's um, strongly significant in what they take. Good question. Uh, with that in mind, if there's a top apex predator above caracals on the landscape, are caracals possibly pushed toward more interactions with 
uh, you know, farmers, you know, wildlife conflict push toward taking livestock and not their natural prey because they're on the boundaries of that landscape under the pressure of an apex predator? Um, so I, I don't think that it doesn't seem like there's any significant difference on whether caracals take more livestock with the presence of apex predators or not. Um, you know, I, I would suspect that, um, yeah, I, I don't think that there's any difference. Um, you know, caracals take, you know, they select for certain prey. And so in, in these, you know, Kalahari regions, in a lot of regions, they're selecting for steambok. Um, and, you know, it's just, if there are apex predators, then they're not able to spend as much time searching for prey. So they're taking prey more on just based on what's available and not selecting for what they actually want to eat. Um, where in areas where there are apex predators, they're taking prey more based on just what's available and not selecting for what they truly want to eat because they're spending more time in fear that they might be killed themselves. So um, I don't think that that's influencing um, whether or not they're taking livestock. Any feeling for the proportion of scavenging in their diet? Because you know, the hyenas, for example, they're big scavengers, but they'll catch their own, own prey as well. Excellent questions. I'm getting the best questions today. Um, yeah, they will almost never scavenge, which is really fascinating. Um, and you know, that's an issue, you know, often they'll try to um, bait them with poison. And so what farmers have found is that just by using poison, you're not going to get caracal. They won't scavenge. Um, and so often they'll just injure birds and put the poison in the injured bird um, so that it's still out there flapping around because that's the only way you can really poison caracal, um, which is uh, particularly awful for those birds. Um, but, you know, it, it obviously is, is not selective for just caracal, anything that sees an injured bird is going to come to bait on it. Um, but they just really would not scavenge. And what was fascinating is they do return to the same carcass. And, you know, I had small females that would take an adult springbok buck and they would feed on that carcass again and again and again until there was nothing left. I mean, it was just absolutely fascinating how little was left. Um, so they'll return to that same carcass over and over and over again and feed off of it. And so some people do take advantage of that and poison that carcass. Um, however, they will not just scavenge on a dead carcass that they discover unless they are absolutely desperate. They will take over carcasses from other predators. Um, and so, you know, I've had scenarios where a jackal's killed something and caracals will absolutely take it over um, or another caracal has killed something. And like if a female's killed one and the dominant male comes around, he'll absolutely take over her carcass um, completely, um, which is fascinating. But it does seem to have to be very fresh um, in order for them to do that. Um, they are very picky eaters. Um, and you know, clearly um, have a refined palate for fresh meat. Have you given any thought to how you would promote, uh, promote interaction between those few farmers that have adopted more successful methods with other farmers who may be willing or interested because if you leave it to happen organically, that will take a long time, I think. You're, you're exactly right. Um, and we have, um, so we've created certificates for the farmer of the year that is, you know, the conservation farmer of the year that um, is truly employing these methods and you know, really living, breathing exactly what, what we're talking about. Um, you know, and hoping that that will move forward. But if you have any advice on how to go about this, uh, I would love suggestions. Um, because I do feel like this is something that needs to come from the farmers themselves and not 
from outside influences. Um, you know, in order for it to truly transform and, you know, make a difference long term. Um, you know, and, um, and so, you know, trying to promote these farmers and just trying to share their story with as many people as possible. Um, you know, fortunately, the farmers that are often thinking about it with these perspectives and have the, you know, foresight to, to really um, apply the best long-term strategies on their farm um, often are leaders within their farming communities. And so um, you know, I'm hoping that it will take time. Nothing's happening overnight. Um, unfortunately, in really good years, farmers seem to be a lot more receptive to implementing some of these methods. And then in drought and lean years, um, they seem to be a lot less um, receptive. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that, that change is taking place, but you're right, it's very slow and, and I would love to see it increased. So if you have suggestions, I'm very open to them. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe just a follow-up question to that. Um, are you seeing um, a shift of uh, farmer's perception with all this information that you presented, moving from uh, caracal as a predator, as a problem animal, towards maybe uh, that we can have a paradigm shift here where we can look at coexistence with this from the normal farmer, not a farmer who is combining uh, animal husbandry with uh, a tourism but just really a farmer who is dependent on livestock farming. Excellent question. Um, and I have, you know, in, you know, an aspect of this research that I found was really important was to never translocate cats. And, you know, most of these farmers had killed a lot of cats in their lifetime. And then now to release this radio collared cat was, you know, um, was very foreign to them. And, um, and I was very transparent. So if a cat did take sheep, I told them. Um, and they were a part of all of the work. I would tell them where the cat was and um, they would go with me to the kill sites. And it was terrifying sometimes because they'd say, okay, we're missing some sheep and I want to go, and we'd, you know, go together, and we'd find the kill site, and we'd go in, and, you know, it was, you know, sometimes terrified, like, okay, you know, if this is a sheep, and this is this person's livelihood, like, you know, I'm going to feel awful about that. Um, they were, you know, taking a huge gamble and a risk, allowing me to, to conduct this research, and we'd go in, and it'd be a steam buck, and, you know, and then we'd go to the next kill site, and it'd be a steam buck, and then there'd be a hare, and then another steam buck, and a lot of these places, it was a lot of steam buck, they, they really decimate steambok populations. Someone should study that. Um, but, um, you know, they, they just, you know, it'd be steambok after steambok after steambok after steambok. And then they'd get on the phone and they'd say, they'd call their neighbor and they'd say, you want to know what my cat's doing? Oh, this caracal, you know, and they'd, and they'd be really excited about it. this caracal is so good. It's only killing steambok. And they were very proud of it. And they would, you know, claim this cat and they you know, were really excited about it. And, um, and it would, you'd see these like glimmers of hope and, you know, that specific farmer would change. Um, the problem was, is that, you know, there were so many and these cats had such enormous territories that the, eventually it would come across another farmer that didn't, um, wasn't receptive and, you know, that had a gin trap or had, um, was out there spotlight shooting and eventually it, it would die, um, even if it never did take sheep. Um, you know, and so I did see these glimmers of hope and many of these farmers who, you know, said this is not gonna work, you know, you know, whatever, you know, we, you know, you're nice enough, you can call her this cat. Um, you know, they, they would be then, you know, they would be completely on board and they would change their methods. Um, however, you know, we need an entire landscape of farmers like that to truly have these stable populations. Um, we don't yet have that. And that was problematic. And then someone else would kill the cat and I'd go in and I'd show, okay, well, you know, they'd say, well, we lost these sheep. And say, well, okay, here are the, here's the data. That cat wasn't even on your farm when you lost these sheep. So you still have a problem on your farm and the cat that wasn't a problem is no longer there. And, you know, and that would open up a dialogue. And then I would talk with that farmer 
and get, you know, new um, specimens and possibly then they would allow me to radio call her the next cat. And so, you know, it was, this momentum was growing very, 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 very slowly. Um, but, you know, we, we do need that entire landscape in order for there to be any real change. Um, but, you know, the, the farmers that were involved, you know, were truly really wonderful people um, for the most part. And, um, and, you know, most of them, I think, changed so much for the better. So. Okay, final question. For a statement and answer to your question. You need to cut down on the predation of stock. You need to have your other prey animals on the farm. With leopard, it's exactly the same. All right. As long as a, a, a cub grows up eating what, something wild, it's not going to go for other things. There are occasional exceptions, and you've got to have the prey animals on your farm. There are farmers that got rid of all their, their springbok. Uh, suddenly, the, the prey animals are gone. And you start having problems with other things. Uh, but that's basically the answer. Keep the prey animals. You've got to farm with the, prey, with the wild animals and with your stock as well. They've both got to be there. Wow, <laughs> it was a, a massive amount of information on there. Um, thank you very much for all the data that you provided in a very short time. Um, I've spoken to Dr. Niels before the time we are allowed to share the data. So um, the PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, please don't publish her data. <laughs> it's her data to publish, but it's for you to read. Um, we also um, have recorded this meeting, so in due course, we're going to have a, a YouTube video of today's presentation if you would like to revisit all that was said, because the amount of data was enormous. Um, I thank you for taking the time and the effort to actually do the research in Namibia, coming from America. And um, as I said before, as uh, Roy Biller said, um, they're very many similarities between the predators and it seems to always fall into the same thing we need to keep a balance uh, the moment humans disrupt the balance we start causing more problems than actually solving any with this i would like to invite you for a drink a uh, donation basket at the debt back because without donation we cannot afford the drinks without the drinks we cannot give you drinks and um yeah have a couple of minutes of chatting and then uh, have a good evening